I'm Sarah Adams. I uh, I presented the talk about recurrent ovarian cancer that was available on online on demand. I'm a GYN oncologist at the University of New Mexico, and I've been working with the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance for several years now, um, most recently in the role of a scientific advisor, which has been really nice for me. I really enjoy being involved with this group. Um, and so this has been set up, as I understand it, as a live Q&A, and the questions are intended to come in through the chat. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Um, I know that there was a request that went out to please not ask too much about your personal treatment plan to try to, or, or if you ask it that way, I'm going to try to generalize the, the question to make it a little bit more broadly applicable. But we'll work our way through as many as we can this afternoon. And thank you all for joining. Um, and I just want to say again that I know that this is a tough topic. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions across the entire spectrum about recurrence or dealing with recurrence or treatment of recurrence or whatever else I can help with. Um, so with that, I guess we'll get started. I think as I understand it, I'll be the only one talking, which is a little strange, um, but I'll do my best to read the questions out loud. Um, and please let me know if, if, if I'm not clear, if you have any questions, please put that feedback in the chat and I'll try to stay uh, tuned into the, the questions. They're actually coming fast and furious right now. So, um, so um, let me know if I missed anything, I'll do my best. So the, so the first one that came in is a question about the integration of Avastin, which is also called Bevacizumab, into treatment for ovarian cancer. And you heard me talk about Avastin in the, in the presentation as a drug that's used to block blood, blood vessel growth. And it can often be used as maintenance treatment after frontline chemotherapy, but sometimes it can be used in the recurrent setting. And so this question is about why Avastin might be used for a for treatment of recurrence instead of frontline treatment? And the answer is there's, there's lots of reasons. Um, some people feel strongly that Avastin should be integrated into frontline treatment, meaning when someone's first diagnosed, she might get carbotaxel and Avastin and then continue with Avastin maintenance afterwards. Sometimes that isn't an appropriate treatment for a person, either because of the type of surgery she had or the comorbidities that she might have had or because a different type of maintenance therapy might be chosen like a PARP inhibitor. And so Avastin might be um, reserved for use at a later time in someone's treatment. For example, at the time of recurrence. And in recurrent disease, Avastin can be used um, as, a, as a primary agent by itself sometimes, although rarely now, often in combination with a chemotherapeutic. And then once it's started with the chemotherapeutic, it's used again as maintenance. So someone might be on in this case, carbodoxyl and Avastin. And after probably about six cycles of carbo and doxyl with the Avastin, the Avastin is continued by itself. And that's to um, suppress tumor growth uh, and prolong the recurrence-free interval after second line treatment. Um, and it can be helpful in both settings, both in the primary setting and in the recurrent setting. And sometimes it can be helpful multiple times during someone's uh, treatment course. Oh, the next one's a welcome. So welcome to the Q&A. Here we go. Um, oh boy. Okay. So there's a question about HIPEC treatment, uh, asking what the latest is about HIPEC treatment. So for people who might not know, HIPEC stands for hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, um, which is infusing chemotherapy into the abdomen at the time of surgery. And that chemotherapy is warmed. Um, and it's thought that both the administration at the time of surgery, as well as the fact that it's warm, uh, contributes to the efficacy in ovarian cancer. And there have been some very compelling studies done um, regarding HIPEC for the treatment of ovarian cancer. And it's currently an area of active investigation through the NRG. There's a, there's a trial that's being developed through the NRG. NRG is the National Consortium for Clinical Trials. And there are some centers that will be, that are already using HIPEC for some patients with ovarian cancer, um, particularly cancers that are of a mucinous histology. Uh, because there's data and other GI cancers that have been extrapolated for treatment of mucinous cancers. So I think the, the simplest answer is that it's an active area of investigation here in the US, um, and there are some centers that are offering HIPEC. It's typically not used in the setting of recurrent disease, just like uh, surgery is typically not used for recurrent disease, but there may be some exceptions to that. Let's see. Oh, here's a great question about genetic testing. Uh, the question is whether genetic testing is something that someone should uh, 
request from their oncologist or speak to their oncologist about? And the answer is yes, please talk to your oncologist about genetic testing. Um, back when I was a resident, there was a lot of hesitancy to do genetic testing because there was concern about identifying somebody as having a high risk for cancer. And happily, there's been some legislation in the meantime that protects people. And now um, finding out someone's genetic background and her particular risk for cancer that, that might be either hereditary or associated with mutations in the tumor itself is extremely helpful for us for designing treatment regimens for people. And it's very helpful for your family to know also if you happen to have a hereditary gene mutation. And so now it's recommended that all people with ovarian cancer undergo genetic testing to look for germline mutations, which are the ones that can be passed down through families that are present in all of your cells, and for mutations in the tumor itself. Those are called somatic mutations. Um, those, for example, tell us what to expect uh, in terms of response to drugs like PARP inhibitors, they tell us some information that can be used to design treatment regimens. They're often, those are often helpful information to have if you're considering a clinical trial. And certainly if you have a hereditary gene mutation, it's something to notify your family about. Um, this is a big push also for cancer prevention because we know that people who carry these gene mutations in their families can be protected against ovarian cancer development through risk-reducing surgery and other methods. Um, so I strongly encourage genetic testing for anyone with an ovarian cancer or um, someone who might have ovarian cancer in their family members. Okay, is there research on the success rate of niraparib at a hundred milligram dosage? Um, so niraparib is one of the PARP inhibitors. It has been studied, I, to be very honest, I don't, I don't remember what the starting dose of niraparib is. I'd have to look it up, but um, it has been tested specifically whether a dose uh, modification approach to using niraparib might be as effective as everybody starting on the same initial dose? And the answer turned out to be yes. And this is dose modification based on someone's platelet level and her weight. And so there is an effort to tailor the use of these PARP inhibitors based on patient factors to try to mitigate some of the toxicity associated with them um, and to maintain the treatment efficacy of them. I'm very sorry, I just can't remember what the different dose levels are. Um, and I don't know if there's specific research about a 100 milligram dose, but there is data about um, tailored dosing, which would be something to discuss with your oncologist. And I think it's pretty exciting because it gets at some of the newer approaches to, to treating people, which is a little bit more person specific. Um, once we learn what kinds of toxicities might be associated with a particular treatment, it turns out that we can um, stave off some of those with some dose modifications up front and still maintain um, efficacy for some of these agents. Oh boy, somebody gave me a link to a study. Uh, I'm sorry, let me circle back to that one um, just to keep things moving, um, but I'll come back to it if we have time at the end. Oh, this is a wonderful question and it's complicated. So the, so the question is that the trials use the proxy result of progression-free survival. And any, are any of them continuing so they can assess overall survival? Um, okay, so, uh, so um, most studies, many studies will use progression-free survival as a primary endpoint because it's something that is, is usually very measurable in the sense that people are on trial until they progress. So they're on trial for that entire progression-free survival period and they're being evaluated as an ongoing study participant. And so we have information about them during that time. Um, progression-free survival is the time from the initiation of treatment until someone has evidence of recurrence. And so usually a study is designed so that there are CT scans at, at predetermined intervals to watch for evidence of progression and oftentimes CA125 levels are also used to monitor people for um, progression or recurrence. And so while someone's enrolled in the trial, they're getting follow-up with the trial um, staff, they're getting labs that are being drawn associated with the trial protocol, they're being monitored for recurrence very closely. Once they have progression, they're usually no longer um, being actively managed with study treatment. They, they, they come off the trial, which is what sometimes people say, but it means that they're no longer being treated with a protocol regimen. 
and their treating oncologist might decide to treat them with lots of different other therapeutics. Um, and so they're usually followed once they've enrolled in the trial for overall survival, but what happens after that progression is very variable for all of the people who participate in the trial. So if you have 100 people in a trial, they're all um, followed the same way and they're all treated with the same or with a study-based regimen during the time that they're on the study until they progress. And then after that, they might choose to enroll in another trial. They might choose to get treatment off trial. They might choose not to have any further treatment. But the study protocol does not dictate what happens after that point. They just follow people for survival. So one of the reasons why progression-free survival is um, sometimes a, a clearer or an easier endpoint to use is because there's a little bit more information about people while they're on the study. And there's just a lot more variability about how they're treated and what's going on with them after the point of progression. But the other answer to this question is that yes, most trials do follow people for overall survival. Um, sometimes the data gets lost, people move, lots of things happen. They don't always have a full um, cohort's worth of information for overall survival the way they usually do for progression-free survival. But you'll notice that a study might be published with a progression-free survival endpoint. And then a couple years later, an update will come out with overall survival data. It's um, also an area of ongoing discussion because uh, overall survival is an endpoint that means a lot to everyone. It's just a more difficult endpoint to study um, and it requires many more people in a trial to get statistical significance for that endpoint. All right, let's see. Ah, okay. So this person's asking about how many times can you use most chemotherapy drugs before you develop an allergy or a hypersensitivity reaction? And how does it present itself? Um, so, so there are a couple of different kinds of chemotherapy responses, toxicities that might um, limit someone's ability to continue or to use a particular drug. Taxol is an example of a drug that can cause hypersensitivity reactions the first time someone's exposed to it. And so you might remember if you got Taxol that people were hovering around your chair when you got your first infusion. And that's why people can have an immediate hypersensitivity reaction to Taxol and we either manage the hypersensitivity reaction or change our plans. Different than that, platinum agents like carboplatin can um, cause sensitivity reactions after cumulative dosing, usually around dose seven, eight or nine uh, of platinum over someone's lifetime, um, people might develop sensitivity to carboplatin. And we sometimes uh, use a desensitization protocol to continue a platinum agent, or we change our plans. Um, other drugs are difficult to continue to use just because the toxicities associated with them, which aren't really hypersensitivity reactions, but are just toxicity, become dose limiting. Um, and a good example of that is neuropathy, which can really be difficult. Um, because it interrupts people's or interferes with people's daily activities and it can be very painful. And so oftentimes we might wanna use Taxol again for cancer reasons, but we can't continue to use it because it's just too toxic for a particular person. And oftentimes those toxicities become more severe or um, appear earlier if the same drug is used a second time for a recurrence or a third time down the road. Uh, and so the, the answer to the question about how do allergies present themselves is it really just sort of depends on what kind of re reaction you're dealing with. Um, if you're talking about a platinum reaction, sometimes people have flushing or shortness of breath or their heart races. Usually if people have any of those symptoms during an infusion, just tell the, the nurses taking care of you or the team taking care of you and they'll be able to evaluate from that. Um, here's another question about PARP inhibitors and thoughts about if someone's using one that's not working, trying a different one. There is, there, there's, it's mostly anecdotal evidence. There aren't really clinical trials where people were switched from one PARP in inhibitor to another. Um, but in clinical practice, sometimes it happens that if someone doesn't tolerate a particular PARP inhibitor or she's on one for a while and has progression, that person might be switched to another PARP inhibitor. These are really interesting drugs and they've definitely had a huge impact on ovarian cancer treatment. And they all, um, they all work the same way in terms of inhibiting the PARP enzyme, but they're all a little bit different in their structure. So they have secondary effects that might be different from one drug to another. 
Um, and these secondary mechanisms include immune mod modulating effects, um, effects on DNA repair beyond just PARP inhibition, and it's something called PARP trapping, which causes DNA damage in tumor cells, um, and effects on metabolism and transcription, lots of mechanisms that might have an impact on disease outcome. And so because those secondary eff effects are different for the different PARP agents, it does make sense that if one isn't working well or isn't tolerated well, it might be worth trying a different, um, a different agent in that same class. All right, let's see. Ah, here's a question about second look surgery. So second look surgery is used to be very standard part of ovarian cancer treatment. Um, people would undergo primary debulking surgery and then chemotherapy, and then their physician would take them back to the OR to look and see if all the cancer was gone. Um, that is generally not done anymore because we are able to get the information we need with uh, CT scans and with CA125s. And so that's largely fallen out of practice. Um, you might see something called a pathologic complete response, which is from that era when people had surgery after chemotherapy. And it's a term that's sometimes used now with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, it's a situation where someone's completed treatment and has surgery for whatever reason, and you see no further evidence of, of cancer. But that's not typical anymore for ovarian cancer. And usually if surgery is done after an initial debulking surgery, it's either a secondary debulking or a surgery to manage recurrence like a bowel obstruction that we talked about in the, in the larger presentation. Can I address what a low-grade survivor would use for maintenance? So I assume that means low-grade histology, so a, a low-grade ovarian cancer. Um, the, that's a great question. The maintenance treatment model that's been developed for ovarian cancer treatment is primarily used in high-grade ovarian cancer, epithelial cancers. And it's a little bit particular for ovarian cancer treatment. It's not used quite as commonly in other tumor types. Um, and it has not really been adapted for low-grade tumors the same way that it has for high-grade epithelial cancers. But there are some treatments for low-grade cancers that are being evaluated in clinical trials currently that show a lot of promise that have a similar structure with maintenance therapy. In particular, there's an ongoing clinical trial that's evaluating whether um, uh, an aromatase inhibitor, a hormone modulating agent, is as effective as chemotherapy in low-grade ovarian cancers. And that trial has people who get chemotherapy followed by the aromatase inhibitor or people who skip the chemotherapy and just get the aromatase inhibitor. And this is really exciting because it presents an opportunity to figure out whether we could skip the toxicity of the chemotherapy and have equivalent results. But that treatment model is very similar to maintenance therapy with PARP inhibitors or Avastin for high-grade cancer where you have a chemotherapy component followed by ongoing treatment with the aromatase inhibitor. Um, there's a question here saying ovarian cancer that's microscopic with no tumors. Can I discuss this difference? I'm not entirely sure what this means, but um, sometimes when we do surgery on people, we talk about someone being optimally cytoreduced. And sometimes we'll say they have they're optimal, meaning there are no tumors greater than a centimeter. And sometimes we'll say that there is no residual visible disease. Um, so there's no disease that's visible at all at the end of the case, not even tiny tumors. Um, we usually think that the best outcome is to have no disease. So we take out as much as we can safely. But in the recurring setting, recurrent setting, as we just talked about with second look surgery, you don't usually look directly surgically. Um, and so as, as we talked about in the presentation, we watch for recurrence based on symptoms and CT scans and tumor markers. And so sometimes people will describe something called a biochemical recurrence, which means that a CA125, the tumor marker rises, but there's no evidence of um, measurable disease on CT scan. And this can be kind of perplexing or, or frustrating sometimes, um, but it, and maybe that's not what this person is asking, but it can be a situation where there's this idea that there's cancer recurrence, but you just can't see it or measure it on the scan. And at least the way my, my head understands this is that, um, as you know, ovarian cancer can scatter through the peritoneal cavity. And sometimes it has just little tiny tumors. We see this at surgery too, that look like little grains of sand. And those aren't big enough to measure on CT scan or to be 
clearly seen on CT scan. Sometimes you'll hear radiologists talk about peritoneal thickening, which is a description of sort of this, you know, more vague change that they can see, but that they can't really put calipers on and measure. Um, and that might be a situation where you, you would consider that the disease is probably microscopic or very small, um, but there's probably disease progression happening. All right, let's see. Ah, here's a question about the implications of CA125 levels and how predictive they are of the likelihood of recurrence or of outcome after treatment. Um, my own opinion about CA125 is that it's really frustrating. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's about the best that we have right now in terms of tumor markers. But um, my experience clinically is that some people have, can have lots of disease and still not have very much of a rise in their CA125 and other people have just a, a little bit of progression on CT scan, but their CO125 goes through the roof. And so I think of it almost like a thermostat, just different people have sort of different uh, magnitudes of CO125 levels based, you know, that correlates with disease on a scan or disease in their body. Um, in general, we think that if the CO125 drops to a normal level during treatment, that portends a good or a better outcome, a better prognosis after chemotherapy. And if the CA125 fails to normalize, then we worry that the risk of recurrence or the risk of residual disease may be higher. But as you know, CA125 can be high for other reasons as well, even in people who have ovarian cancer. And so infections, effusions, other things that might not be directly related to your cancer can alter those numbers. Um, and so usually if, if we have questions about whether someone has a recurrence, we use imaging studies to follow up on the CA125 levels to make decisions about treatment plans. All right, is there any evidence of aromatase inhibitors in high-grade serous ovarian cancer? Yes, so people have used hormonal therapy in high-grade epithelial cancers. It's not usually a frontline treatment the way it can be for low-grade cancers. Um, and that's because the high-grade cancers are, are better controlled typically with cytotoxic therapy, with chemotherapy. Um, but sometimes hormonal therapy, including aromatase inhibitors might be used um, to stabilize somebody's disease or to uh, provide a, a treatment option that's not as toxic as chemotherapy. Um, and there is evidence that it can control tumor growth for varying amounts of times uh, in, in people with high-grade epithelial cancer. Sometimes we'll look for hormone receptor expression on tumors to decide whether someone's a good candidate for hormonal therapy. And that's something that can be done uh, as a test with the pathologist. Um, here's a question asking about, again, about maintenance therapy um, and why it might be integrated into recurrent disease treatment if it wasn't used in the front line. Um, and I, you know, specifically with, well, I guess with PARP inhibitors or with Avastin, which are the two most common uh, drugs used for maintenance therapy in ovarian cancer, um, the answer is there's, there, there might be lots of reasons why someone might not have had maintenance treatment up front. Um, partly depending on how long ago you were treated and what was available at the time, um, as well as what your overall um, health status was uh, and how well the chemotherapy controlled your disease. Um, but it's not, um, not everybody gets maintenance therapy up front. I think it's just become more common over the last couple of years with emerging data, um, but it can be used in the recurrent setting as well, uh, as we talked about with bevacizumab or with um, PARP inhibitors primarily. Um, here's a question about granulosa cell tumors. So granulosa cell tumors are, are sex cord stromal tumors of the ovaries. So these are the, one of the uh, less common types of ovarian cancer. Um, they arise from a different cell type than epithelial cancers. Um, the prognosis associated with granulosa cell tumors is, is generally good. Um, and that's largely because these are indolent tumors that are slow growing. The problem with the fact that they tend to be indolent and slow growing is that they're also less responsive to chemotherapy. And so it's not uncommon in contrast to what we just talked about with the role of surgery for recurrent disease for high grade serious cancers. It's not uncommon for people with stromal tumors to undergo surgery multiple times to resect recurrent disease. Um, and the question is asking specifically about um, evaluating 
hormone receptor status. And I do think that's helpful uh, to consider treatment options for a person. Um, sometimes you can uh, stabilize these cancers also with aromatase inhibitors with other hormonal therapy. And there are some clinical trials that have been uh, ongoing for these cancer types. And I would encourage investigation of uh, a person's eligibility for the clinical trials as well. All right, let's see. Ah, here's a good question. Um, this is a question about how long can you be on a, on a PARP inhibitor um, that notes that most of the studies use maintenance therapy for two years, and how do we know what to do after that, um, which is an excellent question. Um, as you know, these clinical trials are designed the way they're designed um, before we have all of this information that we have now that lots of people um, have been treated with PARP inhibitors. And so this is correct that the original clinical trials of PARP inhibitor maintenance therapy had people on maintenance for two years if they uh, continued to do well without evidence of cancer progression. Um, it appears that it's safe to keep people on PARP inhibitors longer. Some of the scarier side effects associated with PARP inhibition, which are exceedingly rare, um, which are associated with some um, rare types of leukemia, are not or appear not to be more common if people are on these uh, agents past the two-year mark. Um, and there have been people who have been kept on PARP inhibitors um, for many years with good success with disease control. And so oftentimes the decision about whether to continue a PARP inhibitor beyond two years depends on how you feel on the PARP inhibitor um, and how well it's controlling your cancer. Sometimes it makes people feel kind of crummy um, and being on nothing feels good, even though PARP inhibitors can be more tolerable than chemotherapy infusions, they can still cause side effects like fatigue uh, and anemia and nausea. So sometimes people just have this kind of low grade toxicity that they're able to manage, um, but it might be worth considering a break. Sometimes people feel strongly that they don't want to rock the boat and if something's working, they would like to continue. But in terms of safety, the emerging data um, does support um, the safety of continuing these agents beyond two years, if that makes sense for a particular person. Okay. As the Paul B2 gene mutation been associated with ovarian cancer? Yes. Um, I think that there's just less known about what risk is associated with it, but it's in this, a similar pathway with DNA repair. Um, and so the, um, I think that there'll be more and more information about these associated genes um, as time goes on. And Barbara Norquist, I think was speaking today, but she's the expert on these things. So um, if you didn't attend her talk, I would definitely recommend it. She is uh, super uh, bright and very, um, very has a lot of expertise about genetic mutations in ovarian cancer. There's a question about doxel as maintenance treatment. Um, the question is whether doxel alone is used as maintenance after treatment with carboplatin and doxel. Um, usually we don't consider doxel maintenance treatment, although it, it starts to become sort of a semantic issue. But um, I guess in my mind, I think of maintenance treatment as something you plan to be on long-term. And with doxel, uh, we can treat people with six, seven, eight, nine cycles, but then their ability to tolerate the treatment or the risk of toxicity usually becomes dose limiting. Um, and so you might be on carboplatin and doxel and for whatever reason, stop taking the carbo. If you develop a sensitivity reaction to carbo, for example, and might continue the doxel. But I think most people wouldn't continue consider that maintenance treatment because there isn't the same, um, usually the same plan to be on it for a year or two years after treatment, the same way you might with the PARP inhibitor or with the Avastin. Um, Okay, so, so some of these are a little harder to answer. Somebody's asked, somebody's saying their doctor did not want to test their tumor for estrogen receptor and should, uh, should she have that done? You know, um, I just like to have more information so I know what all the treatment options might be. But it's certainly something that can be done down the line. I, I don't think that hormone therapy is usually um, used up front or even in the first couple of recurrences for ovarian cancer. So it can be something that you all decide to test for later on, it's on a preserved tumor that's in the, it's in the bank uh, with the pathologist. So that can be something that you discuss um, if you were interested in that kind of treatment at a later date. 
um, but it's not a time sensitive test, so you can still revisit that. Um, have I heard of using a PARP inhibitor alone for treatment of active ovarian cancer? Yes. Uh, so PARP inhibitors were tested initially in the therapeutic setting um, as well as in the maintenance setting. And um, this is a, a little bit of a tricky question to answer because uh, AstraZeneca and some of the other um, pharmaceutical companies that manufacture PARP inhibitors did obtain FDA approval for the use of them in the therapeutic setting, but they've recently voluntarily withdrawn that indication um, and they're pushing more or focusing more on using them as maintenance therapy um, earlier on someone's treatment course in the frontline setting. Um, and that has to do with follow-up data uh, with some of these clinical trials that I expect will be emerging over the next couple of months or over the next year. Um, but PARP inhibitors have certainly been used as monotherapy for the treatment of recurrent ovarian cancer with good success um, uh, previously. Um, let's see. If, if Avastin was not used in frontline chemo treatments, for example, due to concern about bowel involvement with tumor, can it ever be added to maintenance? Uh, either with a PARP inhibitor or not? Um, th the answer is yes. Uh, so to flesh out the background of this question, I don't remember, I don't think I talked about this in the presentation, but um, Avastin, which is Bevacizumab, that's the anti-angiogenic agent that we've talked about, um, was, was like the PARP inhibitor, you know, 10 years earlier. It was a very exciting addition to ovarian cancer treatment, and it was used a lot uh, when it first came out because it was finally a new agent that seemed to be very effective in ovarian cancer. And what became clear is that there are rare toxicities associated with Avastin that can include GI perforation or, you know, um, having someone end up with a hole in the wall of her intestine, which can cause, as you can imagine, a, um, a, a very serious infection and can in some cases be fatal. Um, and so a lot of attention was paid to this rare but serious uh, toxicity that was associated with the drug, with this drug. And it seems that people who have a uh, tumor that is invading into the wall of their bowel may be at more at, at greater risk of this toxicity. And so sometimes a provider might choose to withhold Avastin if someone has a lot of disease on her bowel or disease that's um, invading through the bowel wall, just with concern about this possibility of GI perforation. Certainly if there's other options to consider, those might be something that you would use first. And if you have a good response and there's no longer active disease on the bowel, you might consider Avastin later on down the road. You'll see this sometimes um, also that people, uh, particularly people who've had surgery on the bowel might not get Avastin immediately after surgery. It might be withheld for a couple of cycles just to allow people to have better wound healing and better healing of the bowel wall after resection before Avastin is introduced into their treatment. Um, and so if that was a concern up front, it may not be a concern down the road and Avastin could be integrated into treatment. Uh, somebody's asking about maintenance treatment for HRD negative. So HRD stands, stands for homologous recombination deficiency, um, which is a deficiency in double-stranded DNA repair pathways. Um, a BRCA mutation is an example of an HRD um, mutation. Um, and so it's a little bit confusing because sometimes people say HRD meaning the presence of a deficiency, like a BRCA mutation. And, and so then the other term is homologous recombination proficient. And then other people make it a du double negative, like an HRD negative, not having an HRD mutation. At any rate, if your tumor has a mutation in the DNA pathway that is, leaves it defective in homologous recombination, it means that your tumor is likely much more sensitive to PARP inhibitors and DNA damaging agents. But there's evidence with some of the PARP inhibitors that there can be benefit even if people don't have um, recognized mutations in that pathway. And there has been benefit in the maintenance setting um, for people who are homologous recombination profic proficient which might be HRD negative, meaning not having an HRD mutation. Okay. Um, and so this is another question about maintenance for HRD and BRCA negative patients. So again, I assume BRCA negative means lack of a mutation. 
Um, and so the answer is that uh, there is some evidence that PARP inhibitors might be useful or Avastin is certainly something that is not uh, restricted to people based on their BRCA mutation status or their HRD status. Someone's asking about kinase inhibitors. So um, there is a class of drugs called, a ty called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So tyrosine kinases are, are a big class of um, uh, usually cell surface receptors that modulate signaling between cells. Uh, and they may be dysfunctional in some cancer types. And so one of the approaches to targeted therapy for lots of different cancers has been to identify these tyrosine kinases and to try to interrupt signaling that might contribute to, um, to cancer growth or might promote cancer growth. Um, in general, there are not... Well, there aren't, well, there might be some, but there, anyway, um, in general, when people are getting uh, like foundation one testing or tumor uh, genomic testing, one of the things we're looking for is expression of um, or mutations in proteins that might indicate that someone would be a good candidate for some of these targeted agents, and they're selected based on the tumor genomic profile. Um, the efficacy is a little bit mixed. Uh, usually these are smaller trials or parts of larger basket trials that include other tumor types, um, but it is definitely very appealing to select a drug based on a, a specific genomic profile of a person's own tumor. Um, here's a question saying, if CA125 is not a good marker for a person, what's the best way to check for recurrence besides symptoms? Uh, symptoms are really the best way to, to check, as well as the exams that are done, uh, the routine surveillance visits. Um, so we subject people to pelvic exams every time we see them for surveillance visits because it gives us an opportunity to um, do a thorough exam to feel for any nodularity or any evidence of, of um, tumor recurrence in the pelvis. Um, we do abdominal exams, we do lung exams, again, for all the same reasons, looking for evidence of cancer recurrence. You're right that CO125 sometimes is not high at the time of diagnosis in people who might have widely metastatic ovarian cancer. And um, it's like what we talked about earlier, that it's just not a sensitive marker for some reason for those people or for those particular tumors. Um, and so then we really rely on symptom changes or exam changes and then imaging, out, uh, imaging studies. Um, here's a person who developed myelodyspl myelodysplastic syndrome from taking Zeluja, or Zedula, what is it, Zeluja, you know, one of the PARP inhibitors, um, and that that has disqualified her from enrolling in clinical trials. I'm so sorry. That's really frustrating. Um, myelodysplastic syndrome is one of those rare toxicities associated with PARP inhibitors that I mentioned earlier, and it technically counts as a second malignancy, and so that's likely why it's disqualifying someone from clinical trial participation, because most trials won't uh, enroll someone who has an additional cancer diagnosis. Um, and I don't have any solution to that. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, here's an interesting question. Is a blood draw to measure tumor circulating cells useful for ovarian cancer? I think the, the, the answer is we don't know yet. Um, so circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA are some of the ways that people are talking about um, developing what are called liquid biopsies for cancer. And this is a really exciting area and, and it's uh, generated a lot of hopefulness, but also a lot of uncertainty across, across lots of different cancer types. It turns out that, um, that tumor cells can get into the circulation and can be captured in the circulation and characterized, um, as well as what's called cell-free DNA. So bits of tumor genomes can be also floating around in the circulation. And so the idea is that perhaps we can get information about a person's risk of recurrence, as well as information about the genomic profile of her tumor, or more excitingly, changes in the genomic profile of her tumor that can um, influence treatment decisions. For example, there have been genomic changes in tumors that are associated with PARP inhibitor resistance. And if you could measure that with a blood test and know that that was happening, that those changes were happening in the tumor, it might help you understand why the PARP inhibitor isn't working as well as you'd like, and also might uh, direct uh, your treatment choices in a different direction. And so it's not ready for prime time yet, but it's definitely under investigation for many cancers, including ovarian cancer. So I think that 
the answer there is stay tuned uh, right now, but there's not really a role for it currently in clinical practice. Um, here's a question about primary peritoneal cancer um, that uh, this person was told is not ovarian cancer, but it's like ovarian cancer. It is really confusing, isn't it? So um, it turns out that ovarian cancer may arise from the fallopian tube, which makes things even more complicated from a naming standpoint, um, and, and also looks exactly like what's called primary peritoneal cancer. And so usually these three things, ovarian epithelial, ovarian cancer, tubal cancer, and primary peritoneal cancer are lumped together in clinical trials. And most clinical trials uh, that are intended for what's classically been called epithelial ovarian cancer are also open to people with primary peritoneal cancer or with tubal cancer. I think, uh, you know, classically the, the definition of primary peritoneal cancer had to do with the distribution of disease. Um, and certainly tubal cancer was not very well recognized because oftentimes the, the tumor on the ovary was the biggest tumor that a person had. And we weren't looking for those pre-malignant lesions in the tube. But these all seem to be um, uh, sort of on the spectrum of the same disease and they certainly look the same under the microscope and we think that it's the same process. When cancer is mainly in the lymph nodes, what's the best way to treat it? I, I don't think that we select chemotherapeutic uh, agents differently based on nodal disease. There is some information that perhaps um, ovarian cancer associated with BRCA mutations might recur more commonly in lymph nodes. Um, there's some, or sorry, in the visceral area and others in the lymph nodes, there's some of that data, but usually if we see evidence of cancer recurrence, we, um, we treat it largely the same way, no matter where it is. Um, and if we see metastatic disease, we assume that it probably isn't um, restricted to one area and most people undergo systemic treatment with, with chemotherapeutic agents, either IV or oral. Um, have there been any clinical trials using mistletoe or IV vitamin C? Yes, there have been clinical trials. Um, I would say that these trials have not advanced in our field, at least um, in the in the kind of evidence that we usually use for um, making a determination about ovarian cancer treatment. So there are, there are reports of testing high-dose vitamin C in mouse models and in a small cohort of women with ovarian cancer, um, uh, but that was not able to definitively demonstrate a survival benefit. And I haven't seen that move forward to uh, later stage clinical trials. I'm also not familiar with uh, clinical trials for mistletoe, but I am aware that some uh, people feel that this is, is beneficial for their treatment. I just don't have the evidence for it. Um, what about alternatives to Avastin in the same class of drugs? Are there some that are less risky for bleeding or blood pressure effects? So this is a great question. There are a couple of different, and I don't mean to leave these out, but there's a couple of different anti-angiogenic drugs that have been incorporated into treatment or into clinical trials. Um, Avastin is the one that's approved in ovarian cancer that's used for maintenance treatment, but there are oral versions, kind of like those tyrosine kinase inhibitor agents we talked about earlier, um, oral agents that block the same pathway, which is called VEGF, vascular endothelial, endothelial growth factor. Um, Sidirinib is one that's been used in clinical trials recently, uh, including for the treatment of ovarian cancer in partnership with PARP inhibitors, as it turns out. Um, and linvatinib is used for the treatment of endometrial cancer. I haven't seen it used in ovarian cancer, but there are other anti-angiogenic drugs. It seems like they all cause high blood pressure, which is sometimes frustrating. Um, there, is, there was one paper that said that when people have high blood pressure, it's correlated with a better response. So that's what I tell people who have high blood pressure on these agents, but um, it can sometimes be dose limiting to have um, blood pressure elevations with these, this class of drugs. Um, and the bleeding uh, risk, I don't know that there's one that has a lower bleeding risk than another. Uh, I just don't have that information, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> hi, Janice Skidmore, <laughs> God, okay. I'm getting uh, love letters in the chat now, thank you. Um, uh, uh, mir mirvituximab is, um, so there's a question here about mirvituximab, <clears throat> which is, I believe, an uh, antibody drug conjugate, but I can't remember what the target is. So let me just look so I don't say it wrong. <clears throat> 
Right, so it's a folate receptor alpha antibody drug conjugate. So I think at the end of my talk, I talked about antibody drug conjugates, um, which are the, it's a newer approach to targeting um, tumors using an antibody fragment that recognizes a particular target on the tumor. In this case, a protein called folate receptor alpha um, linked to a chemotherapeutic agent or a prodrug. And so the antibody part uh, targets the tumor and brings the chemotherapy specifically to the tumor site, and then hopefully the chemotherapeutic kills it. Um, so this is one that's been, that's currently in clinical trials, I believe for ovarian cancer, we have a trial uh, coming down the pike, but I don't think that it's um, available for prescribing outside of a clinical trial yet. And I apologize if I'm outdated on that, but I, I know that it's currently in clinical trials. Um, and I can't frankly, remember whether it's in platinum resistant or platinum sensitive disease, my apologies, I'd have to look back at that. Uh, oh, this is an interesting question about whether these antibody drug conjugates would be an option for people with autoimmune disease. Um, I would wanna look that up to be sure, but I don't see any reason why they couldn't be. So most autoimmune disorders are associated with overactive immune responses to healthy tissue. Um, sometimes mediated by T cells. Um, and you remember that cartoon I had, the T cells are the effector arm of the immune system. Sometimes because of antibodies that they produce that might recognize self cells. But these antibody drug conjugates are not, um, not functioning in the same way because they don't have the back end of the antibody. Uh, antibodies are shaped like a Y. The, the, the triangle part of the Y recognizes the target and the back end is what binds to immune cells that lead to an immune response to something that the antibody recognizes. An antibody drug conjugate has that front end that recognizes the target, but instead of the back end, it has the chemotherapy drug. And so it's, it's not intended to engage an immune response in the same way that naturally produced antibodies do. And so I would expect that people with autoimmune disease would be able to benefit from antibody drug conjugates, whether the rules of the clinical trial um, have any exceptions to that, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know offhand. Okay, uh, so this says CT scan or PET scan. Um, uh, so with ovarian cancer, I, I typically use CT scans because I feel like it gives me the information that I need. The, the times when I use PET scans is if I'm concerned that someone might have, might have um, like irregular tissue that might not be active disease. And that's usually a concern in people who've had radiation treatment. So people with cervix cancer get radiation a lot. When you radiate a tumor, it can kill the tumor, but the tumor might still look like a bulky mass of tissue. And so if you get a CT scan, it still shows a bulky mass of tissue and you don't know if that's active disease or not. With ovarian cancer, that's less of an issue because we're much less likely to use radiation. And so usually a CT, CT scan is sufficient to tell us what we want to know about disease size or disease recurrence. Um, and so I don't typically use PET scans for people with ovarian cancers. Some people prefer to use them. Um, uh, this is a question about people who have um, a long, a long progression-free survival. So people who, and this happens, it's, um, it's really variable, the kind of responses that we see after frontline treatment. Some people recur within a year and some people can recur years later. Um, and the question is, if someone goes a long time without evidence of disease recurrence, how does that shape our choices? The short answer is that um, that person would be very platinum sensitive or her tumor would be considered very platinum sensitive because there had been such a long period of time between the last chemotherapy, typically with a platinum agent and the time that a recurrence is detected. And so yes, usually we would use a platinum agent again and whether it's used together with Taxol or not depends a little bit on how she did with Taxol before. As I said earlier, if people had bad neuropathy the first time we probably wouldn't use Taxol again because the risk would be there and would be higher. Um, and in terms of the PARP inhibitor, yes, she would be eligible for maintenance therapy after that chemotherapy um, using a PARP inhibitor if that was something that made sense uh, in that particular case. Here's a question about why don't we use radiation therapy more often in ovarian cancer? And the reason is that ovarian cancer recurs usually in a place that's difficult to radiate. Um, so radiation therapy is really good if you've got one main spot to attack, like brain metastases, where you really just want to target that one spot. 
Um, but when ovarian cancer recurs in the peritoneal cavity, it's usually widespread with the carcinomatosis with lots of tumors in lots of places. And the other problem with that is that the bowel and the organs in the abdominal cavity are, are very sensitive to radiation. And so they, um, the toxicity associated with radiation is much higher. And so we're just not able to get a, a dose that's uh, sufficient to treat the cancer without also causing a lot of toxicity. People did try there's something called whole abdominal radiation that was tested early on in the treatment of ovarian cancer. And it just turned out to be too toxic to, um, to be used very often. Um, I'm sorry. Should vaccine clinical trials be considered for maintenance therapy? Yes. <laughs> so um, full disclosure, I have a strong interest in immune therapy for ovarian cancer and the develop <laughs> development of tumor vaccines. Um, but I think that there's a lot of reason to think that ovarian cancer could be a great target for vaccine therapy precisely because people are treated with surgery. So you have an opportunity where someone might have advanced disease, but you go and you take it all out. So it's almost like wiping the slate clean. And so after she's had surgery and had chemotherapy, that might be a great time to introduce a vaccine to generate hopefully an immune response to, um, to control cancer growth or, uh, prevent cancer recurrence. And so there have been vaccine trials in ovarian cancer um, uh, led out of some of the really big centers across the country using a patient's own cells to make a vaccine or modified tumor cells to make a vaccine. Um, and many of those have introduced the vaccine in that, they call it consolidation, which is kind of like maintenance therapy, except that you're not continuing to get the vaccine. You get it at the end of chemotherapy to try to wrap things up after you get all that cytotoxic therapy, they give the vaccine and hope that that will protect people um, in the years to come. Uh, so that's just a semantic thing, but yes, I think that there's a lot of reason to be hopeful about vaccines. And I, um, and I think that ovarian cancer could be a very good target for vaccine therapy. Um, there's a lot of thank yous. That's very kind of you all. I appreciate it. Um, any recommendations on things to eat or drink or not to help delay recurrence? Not really. Um, there's a lot of information about diet and cancer and it can sometimes be very confusing and very, um, just sometimes it even feels like it's conflicting. Um, my own feeling is that you, you need to eat to be healthy and um, you need calories and starving the cancer also starves the person. And I'm not sure that that's a help, healthy approach to, to maintaining someone's you know, strength. Um, there was a, there were some abstracts presented at SGO this year, the Society of Gynecologic Oncologists meeting um, that were shocking because they were trying to make sense of, of the role of a keto diet versus a low fat diet versus a normal diet. And at least in mice and huge asterisks here, this was mice. And we've already talked about how different mice are to people, but I think it was a surprise for the investigators that the keto diet made the cancer grow faster, which was not what was expected. And so the way I interpret those experiments are just that it's a really complex interaction between diet and cancer that's um, compounded by your microbiome, which is the population of bacteria that live in your gut that have a huge influence on the kind of immune response that you might have to your cancer and certainly on response to immune therapy. It has to do with the metabolism of the cancer and, and your own metabolism and your own overall health. Um, and just a lot that's not yet understood about how diet and, and tumor interact. So it's a complex question and I don't have a good answer for it, but I usually tell people to try to be healthy and eat what, eat what they can and, and keep their strength up, um, especially when they're on active treatment to try to eat when they can. And you, know, you have those days where you just really feel like it. Um, so someone is asking about this new blood test that can detect up to 50 cancers. That's what we were talking about earlier with the circulating tumor cells and the circulating tumor DNA. Um, uh, the way I feel about such tests is it would be great if they worked. We just don't know if they work yet. And I think it's going to be difficult to figure that out. Um, because, um, as you know, all of the work to try to develop a screening test for ovarian cancer has not yet been successful. Um, uh, and so I think there's a lot of hope attached to this, but I think that the kind of trials that are required will be enormous. And I think that's why the NIH is um, taking such a big role in investigating this approach to cancer screening. 
Oh, so here's a question about this Rice University trial. Maybe this is the same one that the link was, uh, okay, sorry. Okay, sure. So I'm not familiar with the trial to be fair. Um, so all the information I have is what you pasted into the chat, which says that bioengineers have shown they can eradicate advanced stage ovarian and colorectal cancer in mice in as little as six days, which, oh, well, that sounds great. I, I just don't know. And I would need to look at the study to really be able to answer that in a, in a um, appropriate way. Um, the, the caveat I'll say is that, you know, I've also treated mice, as I said earlier, and it's so much simpler. Uh, the cancers that we give mice are uniform. The mice are uniform. They don't have any history of surgery, you know, antibiotics, all the things that people have. Um, and so it's really, it, it can be sometimes depressing because you see such amazing preclinical data. And it just, um, my own experience, even taking things from mice to the clinic has been um, at times, you know, just frustrating because you want to have the same results for people that you've been able to, to demonstrate. So I'll look at the study, but I don't have an answer for you right now. Uh, CAR T cell therapy. Yeah, so that's exciting too, isn't it? I don't think it's ready for prime time. So CAR T cell, CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. Um, we're running out of time, but remember we talked about antibodies having that Y shape and the, the triangle part is recognizing targets in the back end. Um, directs the immune response. These have also been used to modify T cells. So T cells are those effector killer white blood cells. And so people have used that recognition part of the antibody to stick it onto a T cell so that the T cell gets driven specifically to tumor sites. Um, and that has been extremely successful in some kinds of blood cancers and lymphomas, but has not been as successful yet in ovarian cancer. And one of the reasons is it's been difficult to find a target that's universally expressed in ovarian cancer. Um, these trials with the anti antibody drug conjugates are using folate receptor alpha as a target, and that's also been tried with CAR T cell. There's just a lot of complexities in developing these, um, these cell-based therapies uh, and reasons why it's a little bit more complicated in ovarian cancer than it might be in B cell lymphoma, which is where it has been successful, that primarily have to do with having a, a good target and the tumor being able to when you do target something, sometimes the tumor is able to evolve in a way that it doesn't need that protein anymore. And so then it drops that protein and it's no longer visible to the, the infused T cells. So the answer there is it's an active area investigation and there's a lot of hope, but it's not ready yet for prime time. Uh, Sarah DeFeo is recommending eating well after cancer session, which is on demand. Good. So we can, um, we can provide some publicity for the, the nutrition uh, talk. Um, there's a question about alpha lipoic acid for neuropathy. I actually don't have experience with this. So I'm, I apologize. I won't be able to speak to this um, today. And people are going out to the next meeting. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Um, Sarah, I don't see anything that I missed. And it's, it's 3.30 here in Albuquerque. So I think we'll uh, go ahead and close this. My, my pleasure. We'll close the session. Thank you all for being part of this. Um, and I wish you all the best and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.